I'm Catherine Rowley. I'm your lay leader today. I'd like to welcome everybody, everybody here in the sanctuary and everybody on Zoom. So um, I have announcements before we start. First of all, um, I think most importantly, after service today, there, well, at 11.45 it says, so I'm bathroom break. Um, there's going to be sort of a review of the budget that's been proposed for voting on for the, um, for the annual meeting, okay, which I think is there next week, right? And so if you have any kind of concern with how we're spending our money or any investment into uh, where it's spent, um, please stay for this meeting. It'll be on Zoom and in person. Um, also today at 12.30 there is a meeting for the parents of the children that are going to be in their OWL class this year. And I um, remind everybody that we have Taco Tuesday on Tuesdays. It's just a wonderful time for fellowship. It's on Zoom, it's at 7 p.m. Um, the Board of Trustees are meeting uh, at 7 p.m. also on, well, on the 18th. They're not meeting this week. So you know the meetings, if you'd like to just attend a meeting, they're open, it's, um, you want to let the, um, board president know you'd like to attend. Um, and um, reminding, of course, that the annual meeting is the 22nd of May this, this month. And then reminding you also that we are holding a memorial service for Nancy Rutherford on June 26th. So mark it in your calendar. Um, is there anything that anybody feels I forgot that they have to say something about? <laughs> Okay, Steve. Good morning. I have uh, two announcements this morning. The first is kind of brief, and that is uh, we just got back from DeBanneville uh, in the celebration of their 60th anniversary. And that's why we've got matching shirts this morning commemorating that. And uh, I'd advise you to take a look at uucamp.org and see their schedule. They're, they're in the process of getting back to full operation. Uh, the other thing is our uh, spirit level grant, uh, our current balance of contributions is 11850 So we need another $650 only uh, to get to the uh, total that uh, we have committed to match uh, uh, on the uh, grant and I have the uh, thermometer here but I just now got the red marker so we got to fill it in but in, in round numbers it comes to this line right here uh, we have that one that's actually 875 so we're 25 short of that line right there hmm, pretty cool And um, let's, let's enter now into the worship portion of our service, the main deal. So with um, that, I am, we begin by sounding the bowl. We sound the bowl three times. We sound it once for those who came before the Tongva people who were the original stewards of this land and called it home long ago. We also honor our ancestors, the founding members of this congregation who imagined and planted this thriving congregation. We sound it once for those of us here and now, for our members, our friends, our staff, and our extended UU family who grow and care and hold this beloved community together. And we sound it once for those who will come, who will come to call MVUC their home in the future and for all of our wonderful days together ahead. And 
Oh, I did forget something important. I want to announce who our vi how our guest speaker is today. Um, so because he's going to just come and jump in on this service partway through it, and I don't want to take the time to introduce him then. But in case you don't know, um, Michael Eslin, he's spoken with us a number of times. He's one of our favorite people. And um, I'd like to say, tell you what he does. He's a chaplain at the Sims Mann UCLA Center for Integrative Oncology. He's a, um, he's a celebrity. He's a two-time TEDx speaker. He speaks extensively to healthcare professionals, patient populations, and faith communities um, all across the country. And he's worked for years and still does as an, active, um, an activist and educator addressing anti-LGBTQ um, bias in um, the larger community. He was recently inducted into the UCLA Semmel Institute, this is always a good word, Eudaimonia Society. I think I got it right, maybe not. In recognition of having lived a meaningful and driven life. And his speaking, certainly you could feel that. Um, he has a bunch of CDs, four CDs available for purchase and you can get them or you could contact him and see a lot of very cool things on his website, which is www.michaelesselin.com. So I just forgot that. Um, and with that, I will read, and I will say he's designed this service, and I'm so always grateful for him, <laughs> everything. Um, I searched, this is called from um, Finding Tranquility Base, an excerpt from this book by Janet um, Rebhan. I searched among her crayons for a color that represented autumn and pulled out an orange-toned crayon, never used. It read bittersweet, and I wondered why that particular name. Autumn was my favorite time of year. I was always ready for change. I guess some people didn't see it that way. Some people wanted to cling to summer. I loved both seasons, but I thought no one would ever call spring bittersweet, even though it was just another change, another new cycle, and an end to the one season and a beginning for another in an endless, never-ending spiral. And I will light the, um, our chalices with these words by Kate McGowan. It takes love to hold on when you want to let go. It takes love to let go when you want to hold on. So we light this chalice today, ever mindful of that place between holding on and letting go, a place from which the only word we have is love. We light the flame of love within our hearts and within this community. such a flame. Our Calipayan Church, for those of you who are visiting, was gifted to us by our partner congregation in the Philippines um, by the children to our children, and they take it with them when they go to their classes. So um, let's um, speak our covenant together and then um, rise as you um, are willing and able and wish to sing Spirit of Life. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve the world in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony with the divine. Thus do we cover with each other. And then it seems spirit of life.
You guys sounded good. <laughs> so, our children now, if there's any donations for the Beta Center, they could bring those forward and someone could come and get the chalice, the Calipine chalice to carry to your classes. When you want to come? <laughs> and then we'll sing you out. Here, I'll, I'll get it for you. And then... Um, And then we, you should. Uh, you have a time for a lady. Isn't it? Oh, yeah. I forgot. <laughs> Instructions. Oh, my God. Okay. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> Children, sit down. There's going to be a story. This is because, you guys, I'm telling you, I'm usually very centered, but I had to rush home and get my script. <laughs> and I got back here with no seconds to start. So we have a really wonderful, um, it's a video. And it's a story called Instructions. So, and then we'll sing you out. And you can hold that chalice, because I think it's safe. <laughs> That's such a beautiful story, too. Do you all remember all those instructions? <laughs> I think as you go, you'll remember them. So let us sing our children out. Now, you have the, the way we sing them out. The words are in the order of service. I don't know if they're going to come on our screen. Um, but we'll sing. Thank you. So, our reading today is called No Going Back. It's by Wendell Berry. No, no, there is no going back. Less and less you are that possibility you were. More and more you have become those lives and deaths that have belonged to you. You have become a sort of grave containing much that was and is no more in time, beloved then, now, and always. And so you have become a sort of a tree standing over the grave. Now, more than ever, you can be generous towards each day, each day that comes, young to disappear forever and yet remain unaging in the mind. Every day, you have less reason not to give yourself away. And with this, um, it's time for our Sunday offering. Um, we have a basket here, I believe, I hope. Yes. <laughs> and um, you may come forward with your donations. Um, and you may also donate online through PayPal, through snail mail. Um, there is a link on our website that you can just click on and it goes there. So your, um, your contributions support this congregation and make it go. Uh, we're so blessed you're here <laughs> from Lillian Offertory. Um, it was Lily's birthday last week, everybody. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, a little belated. So a joy. <laughs> um, and we have a joy uh, from Alan and Letha. I feel pretty happy about this too. And probably a lot of you do. It's a full moon tonight and there is gonna be an amazing lunar eclipse. So um, something to look forward to. And um, I didn't see any um, thing in the chat. Um, so yeah, and of course I know I'm in a wider since outside of our hearts, we um, hold the people that were affected by the mass shooting in Buffalo in our hearts. And um, we hold the people of the Ukraine. And we hold the, all the beings that are being affected by the fires right now all over. So yes. So um, we'll take a, um, a minute and just sit into a quiet um, sort of prayerful meditation and um, 
concern and joy for what's been expressed today. And when you um, look up again, you'll see Michael in our pulpit. <laughs> As we breathe together, we quiet our minds. We let go of the concerns of the day, the week behind us, the week ahead of us, and we simply follow the empty breath. We come back to that image of the love that resides in that mysterious place between holding on and letting go, a place we might at times call bittersweet. We breathe into a place beneath our need to characterize it as one thing or another, a place in which we can simply surrender into the constant state of change, the endless, never-ending spiral of life. Good morning. A few years ago, uh, my dear friend and colleague at work, Lorelei Bonet, was planning a lecture to give to an upcoming conference for oncology social workers. What are you going to talk about, Lorelei? Ecotones, she said. I'd never heard that word before. What? Is that some kind of a retro punk environmental cover band? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for the ecotones. No, she went on to explain it's those transitional zones in nature between two adjacent ecosystems, like where a grassland meets a forest or where a river meets the sea. I loved that there was a word for these places in nature that fascinate me. She was using it as a metaphor for places that cancer patients often find themselves caught between competing realities. I love it as a metaphor for any of us as we move into life's deeper mysteries, crossing thresholds into territory that is neither one thing nor another, despite all of our wish and desire to see it as such. And yet I find it is in those liminal places that perhaps we have greatest access to truth, or maybe even brush up against the sacred. In the summer of 2005, I took a week-long workshop on Cape Cod with Thomas Moore, the well-known author and psychologist. He's made his life's work a study of the nature of soul. He constructed the workshop in such a way that we only spent a half day together each day because he wanted us to spend the other half day out on the Cape, letting it work its magic on us. He didn't have to tell me twice. I fell in love with the place particularly the marshes and wetlands, these ecotones that are neither land nor sea, changing moment to moment with the swirling of the tides. That love affair continues to this day. Every summer ever since, Scott and I spend a week in Provincetown at the very tip of Cape Cod, and one of my favorite things to do there is to float effortlessly on the incoming or outgoing tide over the marsh. The water is so saline, you can float effortlessly, swallowed up into this magical netherworld. A sunrise or a sunset can be a kind of ecotone too. This transitional time that is neither light nor dark, neither day nor night, and yet it is in that compressed time frame that we find all that awe-inspiring beauty, all of those splendid colors. In February of 2019, I took a solo journey across southern India from east to west, starting in Chennai and ending in Cochin. The penultimate stop on my itinerary was a teeny village called Mutuvankudi, high in the mountains, the western Ghats of Kerala. Not far from the town of Munar, it's a region that's known for tea and spice plantations. 
I spent two nights at the Ecotones Lodge, if you can imagine, eight rooms, Spartan, situated in the most stunning landscape imaginable. One night, I was the only guest in the lodge. The afternoon I arrived, I arranged for two guided walks with a local guide, Vishak. Vishak was 27, bright, smart, curious, knew everything about every plant, every crop, every animal, every bird in the neighborhood. He had a wanderer's heart himself, and he dreamed of destinations far from Kerala, though not quite sure he'd even heard of Los Angeles. Our first walk would be that afternoon, a spice and culture walk. We walked down lanes and pathways through fields and plantations, through jungles, even getting caught in an afternoon rainstorm. Talking, 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 every step of the way, just about everything. It was an enchanted afternoon. Our next walk would be for the next morning, a sunrise walk. He told me he'd pick me up at the lodge at 5.30. I set the alarm for five, got up and took an ice cold shower because 10 more minutes of sleep seemed more precious than the slim chances of any hot water. I got dressed and went outside early because my host, C. Joe, had promised me a hot cup of tea before the walk. The super full moon was still high in the sky, illuminating the landscape in this silvery glow, catching, casting moon shadows everywhere. The breathing stillness of the morning soothed my spirit. The silence, the coolness. Thank God Vishak brought a flashlight because once we went under the canopy of trees, it was so dark you could not see your hand in front of your face. We walked in silence at first. The only sound was the sound of gravel crunching under our feet. But soon the birds began to awake and call out to one another. And there was the call to prayer from a nearby mosque. As we walked a bit further, there was a gong and chanting from a Hindu temple. Once we emerged out from under the canopy of trees back into the moonlight, we didn't need the flashlight anymore. Vishak took a hard left up a steep path. This way, Michael. We scrambled up over rocks and boulders until we landed on this enormous plinth slab of granite high on this precipice with this stunning view of this valley around us, surrounded by mountains. We will wait here for the sun, he said. Okay? Oh, it was more than okay. Emily Dickinson once wrote, I'll tell you how the sun rose, one ribbon at a time. Wasn't like that for me that morning. I was transfixed by the mountaintops and shrouded in clouds, creating another kind of ecotone. You couldn't tell where the land ended and the sky began. And soon a pink glow emerged from behind one of the mountains. And just then this renegade appendage of clouds swirled up in the sky, its edges catching the hidden sunlight. It looked like a fire-breathing dragon and then it just disappeared. And then the sun shone itself and announced the beginning of a new day. We sat there for about 40 minutes. Soon there was more chanting, men's voices in Latin this time from the Catholic Church down in the valley beneath us. And when they stopped, the women began to chant and then the two blended in exquisite harmony. It was a moment of such perfection. Everyone needs this every once in a while, Vishak said. Yes, they do. I said, Vishak, does this Ever get old to you? Is this just another day at work? No, I like this, he said. It's never quite the same. I felt the oddest combo platter of feelings in that moment. I was, of course, profoundly grateful to be able to be here, but also felt this urgent need to imprint my memory with every sensation, every smell, every color, knowing full well that I will never pass this way again. And of course, that's true of every moment in which we live, isn't it? But somehow it seemed more true on that slab of rock. And as one who always wants more, it seems, it also occurred to me that even with the best of luck, the years left for me are fewer than the years I've had some of the clothes in my closet. So there was a kind of sadness too, a longing, wishing for more, but longing mostly for those I loved, wishing they could be there with me on that rock, right there and witness that, especially my mom. Vishak, 
Do you know what that word ecotones means, the name of my lodge where I'm staying? Yes, I think it means like eco-friendly, no? I said, no, it really means a place in nature between two ecosystems that's neither one thing or the other, like where a river meets the sea or a meadow meets a forest, or where your life, as different as it is, meets my life right here on this rock. That's a kind of ecotone. Yes, he said. I wasn't entirely certain that he understood the depth of my meaning, but I knew I was experiencing something akin to Holy Communion in that moment, a definite ecotone. The world of cancer, living with cancer, can certainly be a kind of ecotone. I walk beside hundreds of patients who struggle with, how do I go forward? How do I make decisions? Do I live as if I have all the time in the world, or do I live as if today is my last day? What if it's neither and both? And I'm, if I'm trying to live as if every day is my last day, how do I live with that kind of urgency, trying to make every moment count and be so profound? Wouldn't that rob me of the simplest little pleasures or the, the luxury of wasting time? The process of dying can definitely be an ecotone between life and death. Ask anyone who's walked beside a loved one through their dying, leaving us to witness them slipping away piece by piece, inch by inch, wondering how much of the person we know and loved is even still there. And it's a process that can take years sometimes, leaving us to just wonder about it all and that person we love. Such was the case with my mom over the last few years of her life as dementia enshrouded her sense of clarity about life, even about herself in a kind of fog only parting every now and then, giving us a little glimpse of the mom we knew and remembered, only to be swallowed up again until COPD and a return of lung cancer showed her way to the final exit. I saw her for the last time on March 30th, 2019, and she died eight days later, April 7th. A year earlier, Mother's Day, 2018, Scott and I went to see her. She lived on the Central Coast near Morro Bay. We took her out to lunch in San Luis Obispo and walked around a bit and then just parked it on a bench in front of the mission there in that main plaza. Exasperating, yes, to listen to the same endless closed loop tape of disappointment and frustration and anger and anecdotes I'd heard 10,000 times before. But still, it was a beautiful day, and it seemed far more pleasant to sit here and have this conversation, if you will, than to sit for endless hours in her mobile home in front of HGTV. But just like that, this idea from somewhere else altogether dropped right into my head. Sixteen years earlier, after my mom had survived lung cancer, I took a couple days off of work to go see her to interview her on videotape exhaustively about her life. In those two days, we made six hours of tape. I had never watched the interview. But suddenly it occurred to me, Mom, you want to go home and maybe watch that interview that we did 16 years ago, that videotape? Of course, she had no recollection of making the interview or that the tape existed, but she was game. Sure, honey, that sounds like fun. Let's do that. My intention was twofold. I wondered what kind of gift might there be for my mom to give her her story back to herself. Might there even be a kind of magic in that? Selfishly, I also hope to reacquaint myself, to reconnect with that version of my mom I so dimly remember. And that's not accurate. Of course, I remember her. I just couldn't connect that version of my mom with this angry, addled old woman in front of me, her shadow spilling out everywhere. So that afternoon and evening, we got through four hours of the interview in two sittings. My mom was intrigued, entranced with the process, but thoroughly confused. Now, where was this done and why did we do it? Asking only inches away from where she's sitting on the videotape, look, mom, it's your same front door knob on the front door over there. But she was enthralled. She said, I get it that that's me up there and I remember these stories, but..." I just can't make sense of it. She seems so 
professional-like. I know I was shocked too. But this is fun, honey. Thanks for doing this. The hour grew late and she was tired, so we all went to bed. The next morning, she didn't have any recollection at all of watching the tape or that it even existed. A month later, we went to visit my mom again and watched the last two hours of tape. This would be a far more intense experience. I'd long forgotten that her late beloved Glenn had made a surprise appearance, interruption in our interview. What a joy to see his smiling, playful self. Oh, hi, honey, there's my Glenny, my mom howled. But I did remember that mom closed the interview with a tearful valedictory to each of her three kids, wanting us to remember above all else, no matter what, how much she loved us. A few months before she died, my sister Terry threw her an amazing 90th birthday party. What an unbelievable evening. And shortly afterward, she declined sharply. And after a few days in the hospital and a few days in rehab, she was sent home on hospice. Just to give my sister Terry a break, who had done all the heavy lifting with respect to my mom's care in recent years, a truly heroic job, I took a couple days off work to go take care of my mom. I knew that this would likely be the last time I would ever see her, though she did not. She did not understand that she was on hospice, nor that she would not be getting any better. I, of course, had my hopes and expectations of how I wanted that time to be. I wanted to be so fully present and aware, conscious. The gravity of this threshold that we were crossing together. I'm sure it will surprise no one to know that life doesn't always give us what we want. When she got home from the rehab, she was thoroughly confused and disoriented. On one hand, she knew it was her house, but she would keep asking, was my bedroom always here? Was there always a window on that wall? Was the TV always in the corner? In the oddest way, I was having a parallel experience of disorientation. Is this really my mom? Is this really the last time I'm going to see her forever? And I was present to her as a caregiver, as a chaplain of sorts, but not as her son exactly. I couldn't really connect with the emotional gravity of where we found ourselves. I was so busy tending to the next task, getting the next set of meds ready, getting the next meal prepared, cleaning out this, answering the same question 3,000 times as patiently as I could. Present to her, yes, but not the way I wanted to be. On the last day, the last afternoon I'd spent with her, I want to back up a little bit. Many years earlier, 2006 spring, thanks to my husband, Scott, I took my mom on a trip to Spain for a week. It was a wonderful time. One afternoon, we were in Cordoba. We were walking back to the bus stop to catch the bus back to our hotel. And there's a bit of chill in the air, so we were on the shady side of the street. And I said, Mom, why don't we cross the street, go over, walk on the sunny side? And just like that, we both broke into spontaneous song, grab your coat and get your hat. Leave your worries on the doorstep. Just direct your feet to the sunny side of the street. Singing and dancing with my mom in the middle of the street in Cordoba, Spain. Well, that last afternoon with my mom, we were there seating, sitting at her breakfast table, and I was reminiscing with her about some of the trips we'd gone on together. And I was reminding her about that time in Spain and singing and dancing in Cordoba. And she sang the song again, and we sang it together and knew every word. That was definitely an ecotone moment, meeting together in this place between our very disparate realities that in the end are not so disparate after all. But still, the day I had dreaded since I was four years old and the nuns at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church in Long Beach explained that we're all going to die 
even my mom. Well, that day was here. And I wasn't there for it. Not in the way I wanted to be. But we did have our song. That August, after she died, Scott and I had our week in Provincetown. I was tucked into the side of a sand dune under an umbrella in the pouring rain, watching the tide come in over the marsh, waiting for it to get deep enough for me to go float. Like my mom, I had always loved the rain. That afternoon, I was the only one out on the beach at Herring Cove. Earlier that morning, my brother Steve had sent my sister and me an email, including a poem my mom had written that he had come across. Judging by the tone of the poem, I'd guess it was before Glenn came into her life. So she was maybe in her late 50s, mid 60s, roughly my age. My mom had always written poetry ever since she was a lovesick teenager, working as a cashier in the old Egyptian theater in downtown Long Beach, all alone in the box office and in life, it would seem. She called this poem ageless, and she was reflecting upon the peace and serenity that she felt in the rain, a feeling that was just as vivid now as it had been when she was a young girl, leading her to conclude that she is, we are, ageless, perhaps, at least in the way that we respond to life or allow life to get into us. In recent years, it was harder to discern and remember that ageless part of my mom. And now that she's gone, it's hard to know at times which version of my mom I'm even grieving and which is the essential self. There I was nestled into that sand dune, soaking wet, staring at my phone, reading that poem over and over again and wanting to connect to that ageless part of her, and I just couldn't. My friend Rosa reminds me that a womb is an ageless place as well, a realm that is neither existence nor non-existence, an ecotone to be sure. Michael, there you were in that earthly womb of that sand dune soaking wet next to the marsh. What better place could there be to sit and contemplate your mom? That ecotone, that bridge between two realities can be what one of my patients once called a God moment, I think. A moment in which not much happens in which the stuff and business of life just falls away, leaving room and space for awareness, for connection, for awareness that this moment is all that there is. And it's enough. And it's beautiful. Just like floating effortlessly on the incoming tide, over the marsh, or just like admiring a beautiful sunrise with Vishak in the mountains of Kerala, India, or just like singing that song one last time with my mom. Ageless, yes, perhaps after all, with gold dust at my feet on the sunny side of the street. So be it. I want to share a little introduction before we go into our closing hymn. Of the many condolence messages I received after my mom's death, this one from my friend Buck meant the most. And we lost Buck a year ago as well. I'm so sorry to hear about your mother passing. She was wonderful and I loved her. I smile thinking of her. She loved you kids and made that clear. I remember one Sunday morning when she was with you when you spoke in Santa Monica. We sat next to each other talking and joking, always comfortable that way together. Then things got underway. We quieted down and I kept an eye on her. She was smiling and looking around at the congregation, listening intently, hungry for what you were saying, connecting. She could tell you had a gift could communicate your heart and touch other hearts. 
she leaned into me and whispered, that's my son up there. And it was said with an equal mix of happiness, wonder, admiration, and great pride. And then at the end, without skipping a beat, she said, I just wish they sang songs that I know. <laughs> so in honor of my mom, let's sing a song that she knew. Please join me in singing the sunny side of the street. Stand as you're willing and able. Do you have music there? It's well? up on the Oh, great. And Lily's playing it. She's going to play it. Oh, we're not going to sing it? We're, she's going to play it while we sing it. OK, great. We have a company. OK. Shall we stand? Looking for my order of service here. We're going to extinguish a chalice. Do we have those words handy there? Um, this is the closing of the chalice. We, okay. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Can you maybe exchange? And I've got some benediction words to share. Maybe we could close our eyes and breathe a little bit. As we breathe together, we feel the energy that passes between us and connects us in the family of things. We consider again the image of the ecotone, the place between two worlds, a timeless place. May we keep our eyes and hearts open for those mystical places within us and may we float effortlessly in those places and discover the love that is there for us. Ageless love. And may we give it away freely. So be it. Thank you.